A scientist is someone who asks questions and tries to prove themselves wrong. Okay. I think a lot of people nowadays, they're out to prove themselves right. Yeah. And you get into these back and forth arguments of people just kind of talking at each other. Mm -hmm. And scientists will turn into themselves and say, mm, how am I wrong? So hi everyone and welcome to Mug of Science, part of Pint, on, Pint of Science Australia 2021. I'm Ruvi Lekemwossum, joining me is Dr. Erin Hahn, a postdoctoral fellow at CSIRO. So hi Erin and welcome to Mug of Science. Oh, thanks for having me. Hey, so what have you got in your mug? I am unabashedly sipping a latte this morning. Oh, a latte. <laughs> a double shot latte this morning. That sounds good. So have you always been drinking lattes? Uh, I'm a I'm a recent convert, I yeah. gotta say. Um, I'm originally from the US and we're big drinkers of drip coffee. It's oh, really? more about volume than <laughs> it is about quality. But since moving to Australia, I've firmly embraced the uh, coffee culture here. And yeah. I like my morning lattes now. We do have good coffee. Yeah, you do. Yeah. <laughs> so do you want to tell us a bit about what you do? Uh, so I'm a postdoctoral fellow at the CSIRO. Mm -hmm. I work out of the Australian National Wildlife Collection and I'm kind of the resident molecular geneticist for the collection. I work with uh, vertebrates, mostly mammals, reptiles, um, a bit of amphibians, oh. and I like to think of myself as an enabler for, for other researchers. Okay. I'm working at the forefront of developing new techniques of getting genomic information out of museum specimens. Uh, for a long time, museum specimens have been used to create a picture of what the world and the environment was like over the past 200 years or so. And researchers use lots of different ways to compare specimens from the past to those that are present now, like do, using morphometrics um, and more recently genetic techniques. Mm -hmm. But the bits of DNA that you can get out of museum specimens tend to be really, really small. and with certain specimens, they're preserved in such a way to get a really nice idea of the morphology of the specimen, but they were never preserved with genetics in mind. Mm -hmm. So one method in particular is formalin preservation. So if you think of like um, the frog in a jar from biology class back in high school, right? Mm -hmm. um, Stiff looking things and liquid. Uh, they preserve the shape and, and you know the, the look of the specimen really, really well, mm -hmm. particularly for specimens with um, that wouldn't preserve well through drying. So I think frogs, when you dry them up, they're not going to look particularly good unless, of course, you're making like a cane toad wallet or something. <laughs> <laughs> um, so these specimens are typically preserved in formalin, mm -hmm. and that is really great for looking at morphology, but has been historically terrible for looking at genetics because what formalin does is it goes in and creates all these cross links between the DNA and all the proteins and everything in the okay. cell and kind of creates this like flash picture of the specimen. But when you want to get in and look at the genome, it's all tangled up. Mm. And when you try to extract the DNA, if anything comes out, it comes out in the teeniest, tiniest little fragments that aren't informative. So what I'm doing at the CSIRO is developing new methods of getting more DNA out of specimens, mm -hmm. longer fragments, and then trying to develop alternative methods of deciding if that information from the genome is informative of not just what the genome looked like, but what it was doing. Ah. Which then gives us information about specimen or species response to environmental change. Okay. Yeah. So how do you do that? If someone gives you a desiccated formalin preserved species, yeah. what do you do to it? It really depends on what I'm, I'm getting. So if it is an egg, it might be one particular method. If it's a feather, another. Mm -hmm. um, pretty much as many different types of specimens there are, there's specific methods of extracting the DNA from it. So you have this big diverse toolkit. Of yes, so I'm putting, um, I'm sort of adding to the existing toolkit that's already there yeah. um, and expanding it so that whatever specimen comes my way, I have a method of extracting information out of it and getting okay. it to the researcher. So if yeah. someone gave you one of those frogs preserved in formalin, yeah. what would be the method for that frog? So if it's some kind of like muscle tissue or organ tissue, it's mm -hmm. really a matter of grinding it up into little oh. tiny pieces. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then 
heating it under pressure in order to release those really tightly bound molecules that were induced by our, those links between the molecules that were induced by formalin. Okay. Um, so once you've um, released the DNA from the other molecules in the tissue, then you can go in and digest away all of the molecules that you don't want, so everything mm -hmm. that isn't DNA, um, and then capture it on these little magnetic beads to pull out just those fragments of DNA very carefully. Yeah. Um, then you prepare them for sequencing by putting on some um, special adapters that are recognized by the sequencing machine. Then the sequencing machine goes and makes a bunch of copies and um, gives you the A's, T's, C's, and G's, which were present in the DNA in the specimen. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah that sounds pretty amazing. And at the end, you get these huge, gigantic data files, yeah. <laughs> uh, which you then do some uh, fancy computer work in order to reconstruct the genome of the historical specimen. Wow. So, all of that step from give me specimen to I have data you know, yeah. takes a week or so. And then the majority of my job is sitting in front of a computer staring at A's, C's, T's and G's. Huh. So it sounds like you've got this very diverse skill set that you use in this work. Yeah, more and more so biologists have to be data scientists. Okay. You know, whether we're dealing with genetic data or uh, ecological data of another type, mm -hmm. it's mostly focused on doing data analysis now. Okay. So how did you get into this work? So did you always know you wanted to be a scientist? And did you always know you wanted to be here? Or what is your path? Mine has been a bit of a meandering yeah? path. I'm certainly not one of those scientists that came out of the womb having some kind of question that just drove me and I had to get the answer. Um, admittedly, I got into science because it was challenging. I liked the coursework in school. I always found biology class really interesting. I was mm -hmm. the one always putting my hand up oh, yeah. to divvy out the specimens and do dissections. <laughs> always got me the biggest one. Um, <laughs> And mostly I just found it challenging and awe-inspiring that there was all of this diversity out there and the way that like cells worked. I just thought it was really, really cool. Yeah. But I didn't really see that as a career path necessarily. Um, and on the other hand, I liked being out in nature. I yeah. liked hiking, I liked, you know, going camping. And it wasn't until I was in uni where I saw any opportunity for those two things to really intersect. Okay. And I think it was because, you know, prior to going to university, I'd never met a scientist. I had mm -hmm. no idea what they did. I saw them on television wearing lab coats and I didn't really see how that fit with what I wanted to do. Um, yeah, so it was like taking some courses in uni and discovering that there's this whole field of wildlife genetics that people do. And I was like, oh, this combines that thing that I really like doing, that thing that I find very challenging um, with, you know, that which motivates me, which is preserving our natural world. And so it was like in that moment in uni that I decided I want to be a wildlife geneticist. That sounds huh. great. So it was like you kind of meandered around taking mostly these science courses that challenged and enriched you and then you later on found this field in university you didn't yeah. like have this plan from but I, I really didn't not until i was about you know second year or so in university where i saw this alignment between the thing that i enjoyed doing yeah um which was learning about genetics with the things that motivated me more to my core which was environmental conservation okay so through your career, were you always in Australia or were you somewhere else before? Uh, so uh, probably hear it in my voice, but I'm <laughs> from the United States. I originally grew up in New Jersey, sort of the rural part where it's nice and green and not Newark Airport. Yeah. Um, and spent most of my childhood there, but then needed a bit of a change of scenery, went to university in New Mexico. Uh, and that's where I got my degree in biology and kind of found this love for genetics and wildlife genetics. And, you know, when it came time to make my next career step, I was really keen on getting a PhD and doing academics. And I had to make a strategic decision at that point because I knew that I wanted to have kids. I was a bit of an older uh, undergrad because I spent a little bit too much time um, playing around in my early 20s. But... Um, <laughs> had a good time and helped me figure out who I was. Mm -hmm. And at the end of my, uh, my undergrad degree, I was like, I, I want to have kids and I want to get a PhD. Yeah. So I need to find somewhere where I can make that happen. 
And in the US, they pay you a pittance to do your PhD, just like they do here in Australia. Um, but they also don't give you any childcare support or healthcare. So I had okay. to find somewhere where I could support myself and kids on wow. a PhD stipend. So that meant going somewhere with a lower cost of living. Um, so I kind of found the, the lab mm -hmm. that suited all of those, um, you know, my, both my interests and my financial needs. Uh, and wound up at the University of Arizona, where yeah. I did my PhD with Melanie Culver in the School of Natural Resources. Um, and it was there that I got to interact with wildlife managers as well as geneticists and kind of took on this um, role that I'm, I'm still in today of enabling people working with wildlife to make the best decisions possible given all the data that's available to them. So I was able to advise the managers of an endangered uh, pronghorn population. So pronghorn are a uh, large mammal undulate, think kind of like a deer, but more closely related to a giraffe. Mm -hmm. um, and in Southern Arizona, they're highly endangered such that they were all rounded up and put in captivity. And there was a captive breeding program, which was doing really, really well. Yeah. And they needed to make a decision on where to release the, the pronghorn that they had bred back onto the environment. But because pronghorn had been absent from the wild for so long, they weren't sure which subspecies to put where. Um, and that's where I got my first interaction with museum specimens. I went yeah. and genotyped some museum specimens um, from before the pronghorn had been extirpated from the environment and was able to determine um, which subspecies were where so that I could tell the management um, agencies where to release the pronghorn. And now they're doing really well and they've got really? heaps of more pronghorn out in the wild. So I'm really honored to have been able to have a small piece in the rehabilitation of, of that endangered species. Wow, oh, that's really amazing. Yeah, no, I yeah. think it was really rewarding and was absolutely the best choice for me for my PhD. Yeah. Yeah. So you mentioned that you kind of chose this path because you found it challenging and rewarding. So what kind of challenges you about your research? What is like a difficult problem that you find and that you have to solve? So the most difficult thing about working with museum specimens is that they aren't preserved along with all sorts of details on what happened to the specimen. Okay. Um, you have to infer a lot based on the quality of the specimen and you know the, the rudimentary notes that come along with it. You might know where it was collected and you might even know who preserved it, but you don't necessarily know what um, chemicals it's come in contact with. And so not only is the specimen precious to the museum, mm -hmm. um, but it's a bit of a, a conundrum to researchers of which methods to apply. And yeah. so that's the, the big question hanging over, over me and the one that I'm motivated to solve is to enable researchers to make the right decisions on which methods to apply to get the information that they need out of a specimen, but also to empower collections to confidently lend materials to researchers who to do that research because it's got to be terrifying when you yeah. have one example of a specimen and someone says hey can I have a chunk of that to do some <laughs> research it may or may not work and so I'd really like for there to be um, a, a more informed conversation between curators and researchers about the use and, um, and utility of the specimens in their collections. Okay. So what kind of translation do you have to do to move between the curator world and the scientific world? Because sometimes when you have two different disciplines, they think and they work in different ways. Yeah, they absolutely do. Um, and I have a great appreciation for both sides now. Um, yeah. As a PhD student working with museum specimens, I made a whole bunch of rookie errors when talking to museum <laughs> curators. Oh yeah, what, what's a rookie error? Uh, mostly just sending blank requests for, you have all these specimens, can I have them? No, 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 no. no. You, need to, you need to explain what you're doing with them, Yeah. <laughs> how much you need, um, and from a researcher's perspective, the more is better, just give me, give me everything you can, and uh -huh. without as much of an appreciation for, there is one of these. Mm. There's one specimen from this time period, from this population, um, and other people may want access to this after you. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, it's a humbling experience learning, oh, just how precious these specimens are yeah. and making, you know, having more ownership over, we want to make sure that the work we're doing is useful and of course going to do what we say it's going to do. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, now having worked on both sides, I want to be able to, you know, create, give that dialogue 
more information <laughs> on both sides. Uh, and I think that it will result in a lot of really illuminating science. Yeah. So you mentioned you need to kind of enjoy what you're doing day to day and find little rewards. What are the rewards you find in your work? Because I'm guessing you don't save the endangered proghorns every other day. No, it's not something that happens on a daily basis, unfortunately. <laughs> um, I like to en like engineer little wins into my day. Yeah. Um, and the way that I find is most productive is to I set my little task list and I have a whole bunch that are like very achievable, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> such as make sure to write the figure legend for that paper. <laughs> Just that. Just that little little win. So little wins here and there of feeling like I'm making progress towards a big lofty goal, which you know, if you, you boil down to it, it's save the world. So many of us researchers, <laughs> our goal is save the world, and that's that's unobtainable. And so mm. you need to break it down into like little manageable chunks. Um, you know, whether or not it's you know post something meaningful on Twitter about your research today and engage with the public to make sure that they know more about what you're doing. Little okay. things like that. Um, kind of get you through when the tasks of handling paperwork or dealing with paper rejections or struggling to get your scripts to run on the computer all of these little frustrating things you know as long as you engineered some little wins throughout your day it's it's going to feel like you're making progress and you're making an impact yeah i guess it's important to motivate yourself mm -hmm. day to day yeah yeah so how do you feel um so we kind of conclude our interviews with this question a, to complete this sentence, a, to me, a scientist is someone who... To me, <laughs> a scientist is someone who asks questions and tries to prove themselves wrong. Okay. I think a lot of people nowadays, they're out to prove themselves right. Yeah. And you get into these back and forth arguments of people just kind of talking at each other. Mm -hmm. And scientists will turn into themselves and say, mm, how am I wrong and where can I find evidence that I am wrong so that I can help everyone else understand what's going on better. Yeah, so I guess there's two parts there. There's like the asking questions and the proving yourself wrong. I guess asking questions itself is a skill, right? Because you have to, how do you develop that skill and what sort of questions do you ask that you might not have asked before? It's a really good question. And so you're quite good at this. <laughs> um, not being afraid to ask questions. I think part of being a scientist is understanding how little you know and mm -hmm. feeling comfortable to ask questions. And that requires a supportive environment. And so a lot mm. of scientists come up through the ranks and the ones that succeed are likely the ones who had a supportive uh, scientific culture around them that fostered that feeling comfortable asking questions. And, you know, then you know, kind of differentiating between the questions that you seek the answers for, the questions that you talk to your colleagues about, mm -hmm. um, and the questions that maybe don't have answers. And it's cool to just pose that <laughs> to the scientific community. And then maybe someone who looks at questions or looks at the data very differently um, can have some insight to help you answer that. Yeah. And then once you've got your theory, you kind of investigate what kind of things you can do to prove yourself wrong to solidify your theory or help tweak it in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. But that's all been very interesting. So thanks very much for joining us, Erin. Thanks for chatting with me. Yeah, and hopefully we'll catch up with you sometime in the future. Yeah. yeah. So I'm Ruvi Lakemwassam, and this is Mug of Science, part of Point of Science. Thanks for joining us today.